千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. 所、so, 以《道德经》24: Those who are on tiptoes cannot stand. Those who straddle cannot walk. Those who flaunt themselves are not clear. Those who presume themselves are not distinguished. Those who praise themselves have no merit. Those who boast about themselves do not last. Those with the Tao call such things leftover food or tumors; they despise them. Thus, those who possess the Tao do not engage in them. So, it's important to realize that toward the end, you know, call such things. And then despise them and do not engage in them. Those things are exactly as pointed out from lines one to six to stand on, to be on tiptoes, to straddle, which are metaphors for flaunting, presuming, praising oneself, or boasting about oneself. These are manifestations of arrogance. And these are considered to be like leftover food or tumors. Now, as I mentioned last time, leftover food in ancient times, you know, they didn't have refrigerators back then, so leftover food was the equivalent to trash, to garbage. So to call such things leftover food, it would, would be similar to what we called, you know, crap. The same idea, the same context, garbage, you know, unwanted garbage, or tumors,、uh, which is unwanted growth. So these things are to be despised. These things are to be.、Uh, these things should repose us. And those who possess the Tao do not engage in them. So I'll have a lot more to say about that when we get to the end of our line by line analysis.、Uh, for now, though. Let's quickly review the sections that we identified last time. So we can either do the sectional analysis from the top down or from the bottom up. Either way, we end up with the same division within the chapter. In this case, if we start from the top down, right away we notice that the first two lines have similar characters, as you can see in the highlighted characters. And the first two lines are also the same four characters in length, so they form like a mini section. It's a couplet. Then, next we have lines that are very similar from three down to six. You have similarities there as well. Specifically, you can tell. That the first character and the third character are repeating, and then there's also a third.、Uh, there's also a third repeating character, which is the fourth character. It repeats on three, four, and six. It skips line five. So, if we look at the third and fourth characters and how they repeat, but then. Line five seems to break that pattern, and then we look a little deeper into line five. The character that doesn't follow the other ones, the fourth one, wu, means to have none, is to not have. The other repeating characters is the same bu character that means no. So, the fourth character in each line is the same negative connotation. So these four lines belong in a section together, and now we can bring in the other repeating characters as well that I mentioned at the outset. 
first character repeats, the third character repeats, the fourth character repeats, all except one line. So there you go. That is the second division. And then we go to the last section there, which has no repeating characters, but it's the concluding section that talks about those with the Tao not liking uh, things uh, that have to do with the manifestations of the ego, with the arrogance, which is a, a pretty strong statement. Okay, so that's it. That's the review on the sectional analysis. We have three sections. We have the beginning, the middle, and then we have the conclusion. So that's fairly standard. Many other chapters of the Tao Te Ching have the same, same structure. So we're ready now to uh, identify and analyze the lines one at a time. And I think we'll, we'll probably do uh, maybe one or two lines and then we can, we can take our mid-meeting break. So starting on the first line, you know, we're not wasting any time at all. So let's take a look at the first two characters, those who are on tiptoes. So focusing on just the meaning for now, to stand on tiptoes, what does that mean? What does Lao Tzu mean when he wrote standing on tiptoes, those who stand on tiptoes? His meaning is that these are the people who raise themselves a little higher than other people. Uh, to stand on tiptoes is to raise oneself a little higher temporarily. Well, what does that mean? Physically, that's the action. But the metaphor is that this is someone who pretends to be better than he or she actually is. This is a metaphor for those who pretend to have more, to do well, um, but it's a facade. It's a false projection. They are pretending to be better than they actually are. Therefore, tiptoe, to stand on tiptoes, is to elevate oneself over others, which is an attempt to assume superiority. So we, uh, we definitely see people do this a lot, and I actually do have some examples uh, in a moment, but realize for now that this is about some people trying to look good, trying to make themselves look better than other people by pretending. That's the main idea. So the bottom line in this is at the end of line one where it says those who are on tiptoes cannot stand specifically it means that you can't stand on tiptoes for long that sooner or later you got to come back down so here's the idea no one can stand on tiptoes for long no one can keep up a false front indefinitely sooner or later the lie the deception collapses under its own weight so just like standing on tiptoes, maybe in order to look over other people, you know, in a crowd, well, you can't do that for too long. You're going to have to come back down. You're going to have to, you're going to have to get back to your normal stance. So this is the beginning of the, uh, of the idea in this chapter where Lao Tzu is basically saying that, well, you got to be authentic. You can't be fake. If you are fake, you won't be able to do it for too long. So we'll carry this idea forward. Let's do another line. Let's do uh, another part. Uh, well, let's focus on the second part of this and then the next line. So uh, here I want to kind of drive home or hammer in an idea uh, that this has been talked about elsewhere in the Tao Te Ching that those things that don't last, they are not the Tao. The Tao is the eternal principle, and therefore, anything that shares in the characteristics of the Tao are, would be lasting, would by nature be lasting. Conversely, those that do not, those, that, those, that, those things that are contrary to the Tao, that are against the Tao, opposite the flow of the Tao, those things are are impermanence, they're transient, they come and go. 
So in this case, arrogance brings failure. We have all seen that in daily life. Therefore, cannot last for long. That which does not last is not the Tao. So being arrogant is not the Tao. And remember, uh, there's a very old back and forth here about, hey, but I thought all things are in the Tao. Uh, yeah, you can use the Tao in the context of everything, which includes the positive and the negative. Or you can use the Tao in the context of what Lao Tzu points to as the best path, the path, the way to go, the best path in life. If that is the case, then there's going to be a lot of things that don't belong to the path, such as arrogance. So let's go to the, the next line. So here, we have a character that sometimes gets, gets misinterpreted as taking a big step. So if you translate it as that, those who take a big step cannot walk, well, they're actually walking further. <laughs> so that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. But what it is though, what it actually is in this ancient context is someone who's standing with the, with the legs wide apart, a straddling stance. When you're in a stance like that, what the meaning is, what it's the metaphor of, is to strike an exaggerated pose. And what that means specifically is an attempt to draw attention to yourself, to exaggerate, exaggerate what you do, your movements, your, your stance, your approach, your demeanor, your expressions, what you say. These are all different ways to draw attention to yourself, which goes toward gratifying the ego. And that's again, arrogance. So the problem is when you're exaggerating in order to draw attention, you can't do much of anything. Just like when you've got your legs wide apart, you can't walk. So that's what the original actually says. When you are in a stance like that, there's not going to be that much walking that you do. And walking in this context will be making progress in your journey of life. All right, so let's continue on with line two of Tao Te Ching, chapter 24. So let's take a look at this uh, last two characters here, Bu Xing, uh, those who straddle cannot walk. So this is the cannot walk part. So in this case, cannot walk is Lao Tzu pointing out what happens to those who seek attention. So bottom line, I think it's, I think this is fairly easy to understand. It's about how such people are so concerned about appearance and external approval from others that they fail to walk their path as they should. So cannot walk would be the metaphor for making progress in the journey of life. So conversely, those who do make progress in life are the ones who are not standing on tiptoes, are not straddling. These are the people who keep a low profile. They are the ones who focus on putting one foot in front of the other as they walk their own journey of a thousand miles. And to keep walking, stepping, making steps forward, that is a metaphor for living life one day at a time in accordance to the Tao. Okay, so now what I would like to do uh, as I look at the first two lines, those who are on tiptoes, those who straddle, I want to bring in some modern examples of how we do that. And the reason why I feel this is necessary is because Ego manifestations can be subtle. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. Many times I notice parents, uh, these are uh, Chinese Tao cultivators in the Tao community that I notice, they will talk about being humble. 
they will appear to act very respectfully, but I know they're not humble. Why not? Because even though they make it a point to not talk about themselves, they're constantly comparing their kids with other parents' kids. Like, my child is an honor student, how about yours? You know, they won't quite say it like that, but the context is clear. Or, oh, my kids are so busy learning the, learning the piano and uh, entering the math competition, the, the spelling bee competition. Uh, he did really well. He was the, um, the champion in this county, stuff like that. So they are still arrogant. It's just that they're arrogant by proxy. It's sort of like, you know, uh, a particular country is, appears to be not waging war against another country, but is actually waging a proxy battle through yet another country where there's a, a interest that they want to uh, maintain and therefore is an open conflict out there war by proxy and in this case comparison com competition pissing contest of the ego by proxy by comparing kids so anyhow there are other examples of tiptoeing and straddling that i want to bring up just to make sure that we apply this to our modern lives first Name dropping. So this can be, for instance, celebrity name dropping, or it can be name dropping of someone who's in a position of power and authority. The basic idea is to name drop and associate yourself with someone with greater fame, uh, greater wealth, possibly, greater power, a greater position, and it's done in the hopes of associating yourself with that greatness so that you can be greater too. I was just talking to so-and-so on the phone, you know, just name drop, because the goal is to get the other person to say, what, you know, so-and-so? Oh yeah, you're pretending to be casual. We go back a long way, and like I said, I was just, uh, you know, telling this person that blah, 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 you know. So the actual thing that they want to talk about is not the contents of the conversation, but the fact that, hey, listen to the power, listen to me talk about the powerful friends that I know. I must be a pretty great guy because I know all these cool people. So that's one way to tiptoe or to straddle. Tiptoe and straddle, you know, this is the um, Dao De Jing method of uh, uh, having a metaphor describing uh, manifestations of arrogance. We don't, we don't use that in English. We don't use that not even in modern Mandarin, but that's what it meant. So here's another manifestation of ego, the humble brag. So this is relatively new, but this is something that we do see all the time. So for instance, what about this humble brag? Why can't those guys or those ladies leave me alone? I just want some peace and quiet. So it seems like a complaint. Like, you know, I wish they would just leave me alone. But what, what are they actually saying? They're really saying, look how attractive I am to those men or to those women. So that's a humble brag and here's uh and there's so many different ways to humble brag there's so many variations on the same theme it all comes back to the same thing you know which is look how cool i am look how great i am look how, how awesome i am as a person i am so much better than you haha -ha. that is the humble brag and that is the uh that is the ego at work so another example Heavy sigh, 
I have no idea why they nominated me. Any day now, they, they will realize they made a big mistake, you know, or something else, uh, seemingly self-deprecating. I have no idea why they, why they nominated me. That's a sure sign that they have bad taste. Ha ha. Again, a humble brag. What this person really wants to say is, look, they nominated me. And then using the humble brag as sort of a stealthy way to sneak one in. And one more example. Oh, it sucks to not be able to buy grocery without being recognized. What do they really want to say? Look how famous I am. I'm being recognized everywhere. So the complaint, I can't even live a normal life without paparazzi following me everywhere. Woe is me. Well, it's not a real complaint. It's a way to sneak in a brag about fame. So these are all different modern manifestations of repetition on the same theme. The theme is boasting, bragging, showing off. So in the next section, Lao Tzu goes into details about, about the ego, about manifestations of the ego. So we have those repeating four lines. Let's go through them. Line three, those who flaunt themselves are not clear. So to flaunt, and this is the this is the character, this is the Mandarin character that is usually used as to see. But here it means to be seen. Those who show themselves, those who display themselves, those who show off, basically, those who showcase themselves. So they're not clear uh, is, the, is uh, what Lao Tzu describes. Now, this is the first of the four lines for a specific reason, because those who display or showcase themselves, that's connected to tiptoeing, raising one's profile. You know, when you tiptoe, you want to be seen by more people. Straddling an exaggerated pose to draw attention. So these are all ways of showcasing or displaying yourself, to flaunt yourself. So that's why it's the first of the four lines. Now, it doesn't have to be something physical like, you know, tiptoeing and straddling, like the physical uh, action. It could be something else. There are so many different ways that people try to draw attention. One thing that I see frequently are the people who laugh especially loud at everything. And when you dig a little deeper, it's actually because they want to draw attention. They want to draw attention to themselves. So it's not just something that they act out. Um, it's not just, you know, wearing unconventional clothing or have various, um, have, uh, you know, for instance, outrageous body piercing everywhere, uh, yet another attempt to draw attention. So there's in the Tao, it's always the same idea that if you do a little bit of it, that's okay. It's the yin within the yang and yang within the yin. But there's a point. There's definitely a point when you overdo it and you go well beyond equilibrium. So let's talk about not clear. So in line three, toward the end, You've got two characters, bu ming, meaning not clear. So let's talk about that. There are two possible interpretations. And they can both be correct, but I'll point out one of them as, as the way it probably is. Number one, 
those who try to show off end up just like all other show offs. So ironically, by trying to be special, you know, showcasing themselves, displaying themselves, they reveal themselves to be the opposite, that they're not special, they're just like all the other show offs that came and went. So that's number one, they're not, clear, they're not clearly seen as being different. Number two, to say that they're not clear may point to their own lack of clarity about the Tao. So they are not understanding why they should not flaunt themselves. So the bottom line here is that the first interpretation is better because it makes it makes it uh, matching, it makes it more of a match for the other three lines, for lines four, five, and six. So the poetic match is important and oftentimes helps us figure out what interpretation is the better one. In this case, it's about people who want to be seen by everyone, but end up being seen as being no different than all the show-offs who crave attention. And they crave attention because of their uh, deep-seated sense of inadequacy. Let's move on. Let's go to line four. Line four says, those who presume themselves are not distinguished. So this is similar to line three, because those who presume themselves, they presume that they are correct. They presume that they are superior. They end up looking ignorant and insecure instead. So they have the opposite of effect of what they want. Just like those who want to showcase themselves end up being seen as no different, ironically, those who want to presume their superiority end up achieving the very opposite, looking insecure, looking ignorant instead. So I do want to point out that as we observe life, as we look around us in society, there's a repeating pattern. That people like this, people who, who brag, who boast, people who want to draw attention, they seem to get what they want initially. They seem to get the attention they want. They get the recognition they want. They get into a position uh, a higher position, which is also what they want. However, the repeating pattern in life is that sooner or later, they become exposed as fraudulent or they fail in their position. And sometimes the failure can be pretty spectacular. So it's a pattern that keeps repeating and that's a clue to us that it's one of the predictable patterns in life. It's the Tao that if you go that way, if you go against the Tao, you end up in that predictable place. And therefore, the best way to go is opposite the direction of arrogance, opposite the direction of self-presumption and flaunting. So I think that's clear. Let's move on to line five. Line five says, those who praise themselves have no merit. So I think this one is easy to understand too. We've all seen that praise is much better when it comes from a different direction, not from yourself, but from other people. It's much more powerful when other people say, when other people talk about what you have done as being beneficial rather than you doing it. And that's because self-praise will always be met with skepticism. So this does not mean Dow cultivators refuse to talk about their work. Dow cultivators are happy to talk about what they do. They won't volunteer the information. They won't impose, you know, talking about themselves on other people. But if you ask them about their work, they're glad to talk about it. They don't refuse to talk about it. What it does mean is that they focus on letting their work speak for them. So that's 
Line five, they don't need to praise themselves. They will do the work that draw praise from other people. If what they have done is not succeeding in drawing praise from other people, then they know that they simply haven't done a good enough job. So it's time to go back to the drawing board, review what they have done to improve and do a better job. So that's the behavior of the Dow cultivator. So let's go to line six and finish up the section. So again, I think, you know, fairly easy to understand different ways of talking about the same thing, different manifestations in life. And now we're at the last of the four lines. So with the last of the four lines, here's an emphasis. The emphasis is the last two characters, uh, which is translated to do not last. Here, Lao Zi is emphasizing the impermanence of arrogance. That is, those who are arrogant are transient. They come and go. They don't have lasting power. So this is just one of the many chapters in the Tao Te Ching that speaks against you know, showing off, being arrogant, boasting, bragging. It's a position that Lao Tzu has staked out against the ego. It is in fact, one of the primary themes that is weaved throughout the Tao Te Ching. So we encounter this again and again as we study the Tao Te Ching from beginning to the end. And Lao Tzu, uh, because of Tao principles of moderation and balance, Lao Tzu is not saying that you should eliminate the ego completely. Rather, the idea is to seek the proper balance of the ego. What happens when it's out of balance and it goes into arrogance? Well, we have seen it many times. We have seen how arrogant people show up you know, in our lives they cause a disturbance. And then at some point after that, they inadvertently reveal their shortcomings. And at some point after that, they are quickly forgotten. They're not lasting. So to avoid that fate, to avoid that pattern, it's all about achieving the proper balance of the ego. And to be frank, this is probably the single most difficult challenge, in my opinion, in spiritual cultivation. So a lot of people are still struggling with that. A lot of people still have issues dealing with the ego. So because of the repeated theme that is weaved throughout the Tao Te Ching, uh, I want to treat these four lines with special importance. So I have a slide here that I want to I want to bring to you, basically covering all four lines. And this is a summary. This is another way to state the above. This is a way to summarize what the ego wants and what actually happens, what ultimately happens, what ends up happening to you instead of what the ego wants. So let me explain. As an example, what the ego wants is to hog the spotlight to be seen by everyone. This is the tiptoeing part. What ultimately happens is that they end up, the people who have that ego to hog the spotlight, they end up being seen as no different from other show-offs. And let's face reality, this is the truth. We have all seen many show-offs come and go throughout our lives. I've seen them, you've seen them, everybody has. I don't like them, you don't like them, nobody likes them. Here's the second thing that the ego wants. The egocentric self wants to be distinguished as deserving of recognition. You know, peer approval. Everybody loves me. Give me more love. But what ultimately happens 
when those who brag, those who flaunt, what ultimately happens is that they are dismissed as just another seeker of attention. So I think by now you can tell what the ego wants and what ultimately happens. These match the Tao Te Ching lines and basically just restate what Lao Tzu is trying to say. The ego also wants to claim credit regardless of, of the actual merit. No matter how much they have contributed to an actual project, the ego wants to claim more credit. But because of that, when the truth is out, when these people are exposed as having a problem with their ego, they end up getting little or no credit. So sometimes it can be, it can be um, a detrimental situation in that this person actually has some contribution, but they wildly exaggerate how much they contribute. So the, they end up achieving the reverse and even what they have actually uh, done as contribution, uh, that gets dismissed, that gets, that gets subtracted from, from uh, what should be the merits they deserve. So they end up with less than they should get. Lastly, the ego wants to leave a lasting legacy. You know, it's, it's not enough for, for me to be known in the here and now. I wish to be known from this point on indefinitely, the lasting legacy. Now, what usually happens is that they are quickly forgotten. And here, I want to, I want to inject a quick note for everyone's attention that this whole idea about leaving a lasting legacy and but you know ironically becoming quickly forgotten this is also something that we have to remember in the overall context of impermanence in life so this is something that's taught by the buddha it's something that's very real if you if you think that it's possible to leave a lasting legacy my opinion is that probably you haven't paid a lot of attention to history. What do I mean by that? Well, I think about the people who were famous in the past, like really famous. So a couple of generations ago, Joe DiMaggio, Marlene Dietrich, you know, so many big names known by everyone sort of like, you know, Michael Jackson, uh, celebrities of our time. But a couple of generations pass and younger people have no idea who they were. So even the world famous celebrities from, for instance, the 1950s, now in 2019, they're just not that well known anymore. You're gonna have the few classic film buffs who know about the, the stars of another era. You're gonna have the older generation who are still around, who fondly remember those memories from long ago. But other than those small percentage of people, a small minority, most of the people have no understanding, recognition, recollection, interest in those stars of yesteryear. So if you want to be lasting, it's not gonna be done in the realm of fame. As most people know, celebrity, it's too tied to the material world it doesn't really last. It appears to last, but the ultimate essence is still impermanence. So there's no point in trying to go for that. That is the, uh, that, that's my editorial, that is my opinion. So let's continue on. We're still uh, covering line by line. We're done with lines three to six. 
We're now ready for line seven. So let's break it down in two ways. First, I want to focus on those with the DAO. So the meaning of those with the DAO, that specifically is those who practice spiritual teachings, those who follow or cultivate the DAO. So the context here is that these are the people who are still learning, these are the works in progress. So people who know something about the Tao, who are still learning more, they'll look at these things, arrogance, manifestations of ego, and they will call these things leftover food or tumors. So let me reiterate about the leftover food. This is the, the same point that I made before. I'm just putting it in a slide. As mentioned previously, in modern times, we can use technology to save leftover food for a later meal, i.e. your refrigerator. So we, we forget about a time, you know, right before the refrigerators, we had the uh, humanity, uh, this society had the ice box and the ice box and the ice man, you know, comes bringing the large chunks of ice for the ice box. And, and that's uh, a manifestation of the technology that we used Prior to that, no refrigeration, no way to save leftover food for a later meal. So certainly in ancient times, the times of Laozi, the time when Dao Te Ching was first written, people had no such option. So what they couldn't finish would become trash. It would spoil. It would go bad. And it would go bad in some cases rather quickly. So uh, leftover food will be seen as garbage. So just a reiteration of a point that I have already made. Now let's cover the other part, tumors. So this, this is interesting. So take a look at these two characters. Zui Xing. Pinyin, Pinyin looks a little strange. It suggests that it would be something like Zui Xing, Zui Xing, or Zui Xing. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's actually uh, sounding like zui xing. So what is the meaning? Well, if we break down the two characters literally, we got the first character meaning extraneous, extra, um, you know, uh, something that you don't need, unnecessary, and then the second character is shape. And what it really means is abnormal growth, a tumor. So this is no longer used in modern Mandarin. And in fact, it's been forgotten. In modern Mandarin, you would say, you would use uh, another two different characters that have nothing in common with this one, zong uh, liu. You would talk about tumor in completely with completely different characters. And people have forgotten that this is, uh, this is what what it used to be in ancient times. So in some versions of the Tao Te Ching, other than the Wang Bi edition, it's written as Zui Xing. Sounds the same, but with a different character here for the second character. So this character is Xing as in travel or to go somewhere. Now, People don't know, there's a lot of modern Mandarin speakers who have no idea that this Xing used to be the same as this other character for shape, an immense shape. Today, in modern Mandarin, this character means only travel, to travel someplace, to go someplace. So not knowing the ancient context, knowing only modern Mandarin, they interpret the two characters as extraneous or unnecessary travel. So this is a sure sign they know modern Mandarin, but not ancient Chinese. So what they try to do is that they try to uh, make this into food, leftover food, food is not necessary, and then to, to go the distance that you don't need to go uh, and try to make those uh, similar. So that is not actually correct. 
um, the uh, the meaning is trash and tumor. That's that's kind of the bottom line there. Uh, it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for uh, you know everybody is right. No, there are no wrong opinions. In this case, there is a wrong opinion. Let's move on to line eight. Okay, so line eight. I want to isolate the last two characters. So the opinion again looks a little funny, where e is uh, denoted with uh, with e, and so uh, most English speakers, upon looking at that, will have no idea what that is supposed, how that is supposed to sound. So uh, it's actually e zhi. That's what it sounds like. The two characters literally mean hate them. So hate what? Well, hate leftover food or tumors. And specifically, uh, manifestations of arrogance. That's to be hated. And what does it mean? Well, what you would expect, an intense loathing for that for those things, for those things that are manifestations of the ego. So not a big surprise there, but I think there can be, this can be a little surprising to some people because they are not really expecting that in this ethereal Tao, in this, you know, very high level spiritual thing called the Tao Te Ching, that there would be such a strong emotional statement like, I hate it. I loathe it. I can't stand it. Well, here's the reality. In the real, authentic tradition of Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu does not shy away from expressing strong objections against things that cause problems in life, problems like arrogance. So elsewhere, Lao Tzu also expresses strong objection against violence and killing. So it's not true that there's no good and bad in the Tao. In the Tao specific to the teaching of Lao Tzu, when he's identifying the best way to go in life, he is definitely not shy about pointing out certain things as good, certain things as bad. Certain things are to be embraced certain things to be hated, like arrogance. So my last note there, uh, note the absence of there's no good and bad in the authentic Tao. It's actually very Western. So I wanted to drive home that point. I think it's important because of the misconception that I oftentimes see. I still hear there's a lot. Oh, there's no real good and bad. It's just how you perceive them. There's no, there's nothing intrinsically good or intrinsically evil. Uh, when you actually study the Tao, you're going to hear some of these masters say, no, no, that's bad. Don't do that. Okay. So last line, and then I want to uh, illustrate it. Last line says those who possess the Tao do not engage in them. So let me break down these three characters. The way it sounds in Mandarin is yo dao zhe, uh, and that's kind of tricky. So let me show you the pinyin. The pinyin uh, in this case also doesn't really help. It looks like yu dao zi. People will look at Z-H-E as being sort of like S-H-E, like she. So they would say Yu Dao Z, but that's not correct. The real, the real sound of those three characters is Yu Dao Zhe. So that's what I have here. So let's break it down 
uh, into the, the in, uh, for the uh, definition of the three characters, yo, the first character means to have, and the second character, that's just the character for the Tao. And then the last character means those who, he, who, they, who, she, who, and you're supposed to flip it around. So it would be literally, it would be those who have the Tao. So now let's take a look at the meaning. Those who possess the Tao within, those who have mastered the Tao, uh, sages or advanced cultivators. So here's the bottom line. Those who really get the Tao are the ones who have mastered the ego. So they will never brag. For instance, they will never post pictures on social media to show off various aspects of their lives. Now, I brought up the topic of social media because it is becoming increasingly important in our lives. It's like a magnifying glass. It's the good and the bad writ large. That is, it zooms in, it magnifies the good and the bad, magnifies everything. And that's all the more reason to be mindful when sharing pictures and posts with other people, you know, with your social media friends, with the people who follow you, friends and followers. And here's what I mean by that. In social media, a lot of times people will post selfies. So this is a very common practice, but let's think about and be mindful of the intention behind the selfies. Sometimes the intention purely is to share. You know, this is, uh, this is where I am, this is what's going on now, I want to share this with my friends because they want to know. Other times, the ego creeps in. The, the self-centric thinking, uh, the arrogance creeps in, and selfies become a way to express that ego, to get ego gratification. What do I mean? I mean, look, everybody, look how good I look. Or, hey, everybody, look at the maybe expensive clothes that I'm wearing. Look at the, look at my accessories. Look how fashionable I am. Look how I can afford these expensive accessories and attire. So selfies can easily become a way to express ego arrogance. Another possibility on social media would be things like vacation pictures. And there again, the intention may be, well, I want to let my friends know what I'm doing. They want to know. So I am going to share vacation pictures with them. But just like selfies, it can also be distorted into, look, everybody, I'm enjoying the time of my life. I'm living a better life than you are. Look how great my life is. And with vacation pictures, usually there's pictures of a lot of food. You know, look at this feast that I get to enjoy. Look at this delicious food I'm about to bite into. And that's reiteration on the same theme. Look at how great my life is. Then there can be miscellaneous humble brags. You know, I can't believe, uh, you know, what my, uh, what my significant other has done. Uh, I can't believe how much attention that I'm getting. So I'm bringing this up as a way to present uh, a story 
from Zhuangzi. This story comes from uh, the Tao of Happiness. And the story is part of uh, what I call travel advisories in the journey of life. So it belongs in the section called exactly that from the book, The Tao of Happiness. And the story goes like this. So once upon a time in ancient China, there was a royal envoy that came to a village. And the purpose of the envoy was to look for someone who lived in that village. And that was Zhuangzi. When the envoy found Zhuangzi, he bowed and he said, Master, I bring greetings from His Majesty, King Wei of the Chu Kingdom. The king is a great admirer of yours and would like to offer you an invitation. So Zhuangzi knew what this meant. Zhuangzi knew that the envoy wanted to express that the king has heard of the work that Zhuangzi has done, knew that Zhuangzi was a great sage. You know, it's like when we say, I'm a big fan. And when the envoy said, the king would like to offer you an invitation, that would be just another way to say the king would like to give you a job offer. So Zhuangzi smiled and said nothing, and the envoy continued. He said, his majesty has great plans for the kingdom and needs a sage like yourself as his royal minister. This is a position of tremendous power, as I'm sure you are aware, master. As a result of having a position like this, you can expect to live in luxury and comfort at the palace, and you will have nothing but the finest clothing and food, and everyone must bow down to you with the greatest respect because you will represent his majesty in everything you say and do. You are the, you are the stand-in or the proxy for the king. So pretty much anyone from that time in history would jump at the chance, would uh, regard this as the incredible opportunity of a lifetime. So the envoy thought it would be the same with Zhuangzi. The envoy thought Zhuangzi would be excited, but Zhuangzi did not seem particularly impressed. So instead, as calm as ever, he asked the Zhuangzi, have you ever seen the cow that is prepared for sacrifice? The annual festival is coming, so the cow must be prepared. In preparation, what the peasants do is that they drape this beautiful ceremonial cloth over the cow. And to ensure that the cow is properly fattened, they feed it the finest feed. They feed it as much as it wants. So when the time comes for the annual celebration, the annual festival, they lead it to the temple for the ritual. As they do that, passing through the village, all the villagers in sight kneel down and pray to the sacrificial cow for good luck. Have you ever seen it? So this question was unexpected to the envoy because it was completely unconnected to the job that he was there to do, which was to relay the message from the king to the sage. So, so unexpected and surprising, the envoy just nodded in response. So Zhuangzi continued, when the cow is about to be slaughtered for the ritual, do you think it wants to be there? If you were in the cow's position and aware 
what's going to happen. Would you not rather exchange places with the calves out in the field? So carefree, just grazing? Wouldn't you want that? The envoy said, well, you know, that's kind of a no-brainer. Of course I would, master. You know, I would not want to be slaughtered. I would want, I would rather be out in the field grazing, relaxing without a care in the world. So then Zhuangzi says, you would exchange places with the, with the, with the calves out in the field, even if that means giving up the finest clothing, the cloth they drape over you, and the finest food, as well as the respect of all the people who bow down to you. So what if you have to give all that up to avoid being slaughtered? So the envoy finally understood what Zhuangzi was trying to say. So Zhuangzi smiled again. He said, I think you know my answer now. Please convey my gratitude to His Majesty for thinking of me. The end. So that's the story from Zhuangzi. And I think that it has some points in similarity to what we're talking about here, which is why I brought up that social media thing. Again, it's to reflect on this particular story. So we know that in our society, it's not uncommon for uh, high achievers to, to neglect their health and relationships. So in public, they appear to be similar to the royal minister that they enjoy all the good things in life and they command everyone else, but privately they may feel more like the sacrificial cow because they have sacrificed their health and relationships. So I want to make sure we all get the symbolic significance of the different elements in this story. It's all about the temptations that we chase after. So for instance, the blanket to cover the cow is the material things that we desire. The feed for the cow, the top quality feed, it's the physical pleasures that we seek, including you know, good food and luxuries. The praying of the villagers to the cow, that represents the attention we crave. And so now you see why I talk about uh, seeking attention, taking pictures of vacation, taking pictures of food, uh, you know, wanting to show off your relationships, stuff like that. Because we all do this, it's human nature from ancient times to modern times. So the message from Zhuangzi is that these attractive things, you know, luxuries, uh, vacations, food, etc., carry to an extreme, can lead us down a path of destruction. You see, the festival may be a celebration for the villagers, but for the cow, it's the end of the road. So I want to single out the elements from the story. To reiterate and emphasize, the cow has beautiful ceremonial cloth over it. The minister wears the finest clothes in accordance with his position. There's the correspondence. The cow feasts on top quality feed as much as it wants. The minister lives in the palace and dines on the finest foods. The peasants kneel before the cow and pray to it for good luck. And in a similar way, everyone must bow down to the minister in deference to the man who represents the king. Now the negative consequences of this kind of ego-driven pursuit. The cow has no choice but to be led to the slaughter for the annual festival. For the minister, well, the, the minister has to take the blame for everything that upsets the king. So we are the minister, or we 
are the people who are approached by the envoy for this incredible opportunity to be the minister. Uh, and the minister represents the pursuit of desires. So all of us pursue not just clothes, but material things that signal wealth. We all indulge in not just eating, but all physical pleasures. And we also seek fame plus approval, validation, and recognition of others. So in the proper proportion, these can all be life affirming. These, these can all be very good things. These can all be very positive. They contribute to the joy in life. But in extreme, in excess, they cause us to end up neglecting more important things in life, like health and family. So that is the message from 24, and it's also the message from Zhuangzi. And that's one of the ways that I know that we're on the right track, because we're talking about the Tao from different sages, and in different ways, they're saying the same thing. So we're ready now for the summary today. So in summary, I have three reminders from 24. The first one has to do with the metaphor from Lao Tzu about the journey of life, traveling the journey of life and making progress. So here it is, travel the journey of life. You can make better progress in life if you are not preoccupied with being seen or drawing attention to yourself. And I think everyone got that message loud and clear directly from Zhuangzi. Number two, practice the Tao of humility. This is from the middle section where we see the things that Tao cultivators do not do, such as boasting. Refrain from boasting and be mindful of the ego because it can manifest in subtle ways. There are so many things that the ego or arrogance can come out. We just have to be extra careful. So from the chapter, we have the uh, metaphors for uh, straddling, for tiptoeing, leading to the things that Dell cultivators will not do and indeed uh, hate with, uh, with passion. Things like, like praising oneself, showcasing oneself, etc. So that's the Dell of humility. So there's one more, one more item. And the way that I express it is that I say, develop your own code your own code to live by, your own code of honor, your own way about life. And here, I want to encourage you to be like Lao Tzu. What I mean by that is don't buy into this stuff about how there's nothing good or bad or intrinsically good or evil or stuff like that. Don't sacrifice your critical faculties. Be like Lao Tzu point to certain things in your life as bad or negative, you already know what they are. You've seen the negative consequences of engaging in some of these behaviors that are self-destructive. Those are not the Tao. So recognize that some things really are just obstacles in your way. They get in the way of your journey of life. So you have an obligation to get around them, to remove them as obstacles. And that's why I say, develop your own code. You know, don't be afraid to point to certain things as being just bad, just bad ideas, just things that you don't need. If nothing else, I hope that this is what you get out of our discussion of 24, in that you need to develop your own sense of what is good or bad by your own standards. You know, don't impose it on other people, but live by that as your code. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.